All right. All right. All right. So we go ahead and get started. I don't have no fancy intros or nothing yet. I'm still kind of developing the conceptual framework for a pop for the podcast. Most of I'm just enjoying talking to folks and not thinking about the video parts. Cause I've mm-hmm. basically always done this with a lot of my videos. Um, and it just kind of became like use all the parts of the animal, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, and then it was like, okay, I'll just do this independently and see, see what happens. Uh, cause this is a, le- a lot less of a, a lift than the long ass video essays. Um, yeah. so, uh, I guess introduce yourself, um, you, you, you know, general background and like, you know, kind of the scope of, of interest for those who won't know who you are, uh, or that'll be new to, uh, to, you know, your presence here. Yeah. Hold on. Um, sorry. There's one okay. other I had to pull up. Um, no, I go by the name Two black, um, spoken word, poet, um, poet, organizer, now author, um podcaster black Myth podcast um so i've been doing poetry specifically that's kind of what got me into a lot of this other stuff honestly mm-hmm. um performing it throughout my my 20s and even my early my late teens um uh, and then always did activism but got more into the organizing side of it later on poetry was always something that i used as a as a means of trying to create some kind of analysis even when I didn't know what I was really doing. Hmm. Uh, so I always did research for poems. I always, I could probably citate my poems if I wanted to hmm. or annotate them, I guess, but I never really, never really got to that point. But since I always did research, I was always interested in reading more books, you know, watching documentaries, um, just getting deeper into the stuff. Then when we started the Black Myths podcast, it forced that skill set to grow even more because we have to debunk myths. So you got to go read multiple books you got to talk to authors with you know four phds and things of that nature so it just forced me to become more of a researcher and form an analysis about about the world around me um so that's that's pretty that's like a short opening i mean i could go all day on that but yeah. no that's that's a, a really interesting cool place to start i had a conversation with um fuck i'm gonna fuck up his name now he, he used to host ill doctrine he still does radio Hot yellow bi- biracial brother, um, Jay Smooth, uh, mm-hmm. way back when. Yeah. Um, he used the term homegrown intellectual. Um, and I would I would use that to to describe you as a as a as a as an accolade because when I when I met you in my first couple of inter- that interactions with you, I thought you were an academic. You know, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> you had to laugh like that. <laughs> Well, I thought you were. Well, you know, the- <laughs> real quick, what's funny is I didn't. I thought I was just like no, but when I when I rewatched it, and then everybody's like, "Bro, you got kind of mad." I was like, "Wasn't mad, but I guess I came off a little hot, so just <laughs> laughing, because I thought I was just like, no, nah, I'm not an academic." They was like, "Bro, you look like you were offended." No, uh, <laughs> 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 I didn't catch it until after the fact. I was like, "Oh, I didn't know it was that bad." It's all right, man. You got a, you got a, you got a real. <laughs> You know, I would like of all the things I would have attributed to you upon our first couple of interactions, um, I, I would have guessed academic. And then you also have a very no nonsense demeanor. Mm. You got black dad energy and I don't even think you got any kids. No, I don't. Yeah, but yeah. like are you you know that uh, the character uh, um, Dave Chappelle dad character with the cigarette in his mouth. Mm. You don't smile like you, you kind of got that yeah. general b- veneer. You know what I'm saying? So making you laugh right. right here is already like a new thing for me in our interactions. Yeah. Um, but we all topic already. Um, but I, I saw you as a uh, as an academic because um you 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 kind of uh spoke with and clearly presented such a, a depth of knowledge around the topic. And also, you know, there's a uh you know, for better or for worse, you know, academics feel like they belong in the conversation, right? Mm, and yeah. like, and and sometimes with non-academics who are still intellectuals, they oft, I often notice them kind of, um, kind of make, kind of like make excuses for their presence in a, in a weird way. Does that make sense? It's like, they, they kind of like ask for, for permission to be intellectuals in like certain conversations. It's like, nah, if you got the knowledge, you got the knowledge and speak on it. 
Right. And so when you jumped in and in all our conversations, we just kind of uh, going back and forth. It felt like I was talking to an academic because of how much information you have and how much you've clearly read and researched on the topics we get into. Um, and I think that's also, that's one thing I've been trying to be more uh, intentional about is engaging with and, and platforming and like putting out there black folks who haven't had, don't have student loan debt to that, to, as, as a, a company, the intellectual, the intellectual abilities. I have, I have student loan debt for sure, but, <laughs> but, but, but not, from, get, not from studying this shit, right? Yeah, not from studying. Yeah. But you get my overall point, I, yeah, you know, and it's yeah. something we've talked about before, like the, and it's it's funny, when I my, when I was last on uh, Black Power Media, they were taking me to tax for my participation in uh, Illuminati's video, which is a whole different conversation. I feel like they kind of got it wrong a little bit, but I was kind of trying to speak to this online space being very uh, dominated by uh, academics and petite bourgeois folks that maybe can talk to the game and have good intentions, but uh, are very lacking in practical and pragmatic connections to the communities and the people they purport mm -hmm. to want to support and, and represent. And so when I find when I'm when I'm able to engage with folks like you or BP, who was in the um the abolition video, my homeboy John Lewis, who's just in the roundaway brother, also from the Midwest, et cetera, I, I really want to kind of bang the drum. Like these are folks y'all should be engaging with and watching as much as you watch me, because they're able to offer the same thing, but more useful for I I, I think more useful. I sometimes say that to disparage myself, but very useful for like access to populations that don't get access to the stuff we're talking about like they got to do what you did and kind of pull it from one from one lane to another um i'm sorry i got neighbors staring at me um from one lane to another to make it um actionable um before we go on i want actually I'm, I'm rambling talk to me about the poetry thing were you kind of like in the conscious poetry community you know what i'm saying like spoken word uh is that can you get into that and get into that transition because that's a community i'm familiar with and i find um, I found before I engaged with y'all, like, because I think uh, uh, um, Diallo is also a former poet. Uh, if not, if I, I'm not I, mistaken. Didn't, I didn't know that. I yeah. didn't know that. I, I think could, he it, was. that would make sense, but I didn't, I didn't <laughs> know that. Yeah. Um, and so, like, within that community, it feels like there's like two lanes, there's two wolves. So, you have like the, the cultural black nationalists, like, I think Umar was a former poet, and so that was that's real strong there, and that's kind of the reason reasons I checked out pretty early and I didn't know folks like you was kind of banging the drum in a different direction until really relatively recently so kind of talk about like walking through that path a little bit I think that's just interesting to know yeah that's a honestly part of the analysis that I arrived at for the book laundering black rage came somewhat from being tied to that community I'll get to that later but yeah I think I arrived on the scene when I was in I think I was like 20 years old. Um, you know, I was I'm originally from a small city in Indiana, Indiana. So I didn't so we didn't really get uh we didn't get that kind of like open mic and yeah. like I grew up on like deaf poetry jam and all of that. So I always wanted to go to something like that, but I didn't know that was a thing. And I think I was looking for an open mic once and I this is before social media was really that big. So I mm -hmm. came across some article on the internet and somebody left their number at the bottom. And I called the person and it was this little random spot in the hood um, that what that on the outside doesn't look that great. And you go in, it looks like this kind of like ball club or something. It was interesting, a little small spot. Um, and that, and then from there, I just met everybody. <clears throat> and I was already performing in college and performing in school and stuff. Uh, but the scene is seen. I think I grew a disillusion with it over time, but it, but it did, but what it does do for all my criticisms of it is open the open mic scene, the slam poetry on a lesser note, definitely not much of a fan of that, even though I've done it. Um, it does allow you a space to develop your ideas. And I always say poets are theorists. A lot of us just don't know it. <laughs> and a lot of times why we get caught up in some of the more, you know, loosey goosey shit is because we don't know we're not being disciplined in that way. Mm -hmm. But you're really writing something down. You're getting in front of an audience. 
you're working out an idea you're if you're doing it well you're observing how the audience responds and that's what i do love about it is you get the direct response yeah you're not it's waiting to read a, yeah you're not waiting to, you're not waiting to read a comment section you're not waiting on a peer review mm -hmm. you know you're not waiting on some some like like some long-term thing it's like right there you get to see how it handles it and then if there's multiple audiences you get to take it to those different audiences that might be a little different you know like one might be a little more bourgeois some might be more multicultural some might like more pro-black shit some like to hear more love poems like i remember growing up every open mic had its own kind of thing yeah. with what they wanted to hear right the the the, the, the slutty uh male mm -hmm. love poems mm -hmm. uh are are a classic one of my homeboys yeah. one of my homeboys i watched him perform this poem like four or five times he left with a different girl every yep. time after this yep. poem yep. <laughs> yep that was the times yep that was the times i didn't do that but <laughs> that was definitely i mean that was but but then it, certain things became i don't know if they were, i would call them political but they were certain challenges so if this if the audience was like prone to this you would be like okay can i still make my political stuff work in front of that kind of audience mm. and that lets you know if you wrote a good poem like if you could communicate your ideas because they're not really listening for that they want to hear you say you know like love jones a a baby cannot be your slave like that's right. what they want to hear <laughs> so if you can hit them with something political and they're still like yeah then you've Please done this too. Yeah. yeah, you've done something right. But it but it teaches you all these different ways to write. It teaches mm -hmm. you all these different ways to communicate that you don't even know you're learning, you mm -hmm. know, because you because you just get the direct response, like, oh, no one claps. Hmm. Like you gotta sit with that, you know what I'm saying? Or, yeah. or people was on their phones or dudes was talking to their girls, nobody was really looking at you. But if you could get people to like stop talking. You know, I remember one time I went to this event. It was in uh, Ella. It was at a college actually, but it was, I think it was Illinois State. And Illinois State, at least at the time, was hood as fuck, right? Yeah, it still so, probably is. Okay, I got, I got cousins that went there. <laughs> yeah, so you go there and it's like people are twerking, dancing, and it was an open mic, and like nobody listened to anybody on the mic. So like you'd be up there performing, folks is doing whatever they want, right? So the job was like, if you could get everybody to shut up and listen, like you knew you got, you did it. And I think by like poem two, I had everybody on the wall who was dancing. They were like quiet, sitting down like children, you know, listening. And you only got like 30 minutes before they go back to whatever they was on. Right. That always lets you know, did you write something? You have to have that in your bag. Yeah. That, that one the poem that kind of, right. That can kind of grab them. And if you don't, you know they're not listening so it's it's a it's much more of an apollo kind of vibe mm -hmm. you know if you travel and do it and i think you know the online space it's easy to get a crowd that just automatically cheers you on right right you, know, you it's, can it's cultivated yeah. in the and then yeah. the, um the algorithm you know that's one of my pet things i talk about in every aspect of, of what we do here the recommendation system finds people that are looking for you Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And and they may, they may not even know they're looking for you uh, until they find you. And they'll be like, oh, I've been looking like that's one of the comments that I love to see because one, it means that, you know, numbers go up and it's successful. But like, oh, I mean, I've been waiting to hear somebody talk about X, Y, and Z, such right. and such. Like, yeah. So transitioning, because I, I I do think it actually does relate to your your book. Um, And I, so the book is is Laundering Black Rage. When is it? When is it out? Or what, what, where are we at? Uh, so we're at, right now, the pre-order just came out yesterday, uh, so you can pre-order it. I'm going to give you a 20% discount code because it's a Rutledge book, so they, oh, they, up, they up price the books a bit. That's uh, what's up, but not still. So, you, want, you want me to put that in the actual description for the pod? Please, yeah, I'll, I'll send it to you, the the code. Okay. People can go to Rutledge and get 20% off. Um, it's be, it's written by myself and, a, and, an, and an academic, Dr. Rasul Mawad. That's a whole other thing to get into as far as co-writing with an academic having that difference in there's a whole funny story about that i don't know if you want to get into it but... I, I, I i don't know I, I have so many i have so much stuff because as i as i read through the book um the book kind of in a in an interesting way put me in like helped me i don't want to say put me in my place but it kind of made me look at my role in that concept um mm -hmm. and the role that all of this is all of this entertainment, um, po po political consumption is in that concept, but also like, uh, 
I guess I want to say a victim, but a a survivor maybe of what you kind of describe in the book, which is kind of this process through which the the black rage, the the reality of what black people are going through, gets recycled and re uh, essentially reused or re repositioned to do other things to serve mm -hmm. the same forces that caused the pain in the first place. Yeah. And when we, when we talk about like, you know, poetry and the conscious community, um, cause I have a lot of familiarity with that growing up around it. And to a great extent, that was where I went to go find girls when I was in undergrad. Right. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to hit the club. I was trying to go to Apache cafe here in Atlanta. Yeah. Cause those are the girls I was into. And like, I, it's funny. I was talking to another, another roundaway brother. I just popped up on his podcast uh, last week. Um, he's from St. Louis, right? So he's, you know, again, Midwest cat. And he called me a hotel um, on another thing. That's how we ended up talking because I kind of had to go defend my name. <laughs> and I was like, yo, I'm gonna be real. So much of the hotel oeuvre and persona is about getting, is dudes trying to get ass, dudes trying to get girls. Like so much of it starts with that in mind is I can't be, I, I'm not a ball player. I'm not a, I'm not a real revolutionary. I'm not a, you know, this, but like, if I can talk this game here, there's a collection of people that will give me attention mm -hmm. and in, in the process with that though, getting back to your book, all these other aspects and dynamics get kind of washed out in, into, you know, into the, the, the afterbirth of, of what the whole point of some of these politics are. And that's so normalized that we don't even see it. And I think your book does a great job of crystallizing it. I think it's a great, uh, I want to say first step, like disparagingly, but like, I think your book, should, every person that got an HBCU degree and considers himself woke needs to read your book because it kind of takes a moment to disabuse a lot of notions of what that looks like and recontextualize it into what it needs to be. Does that kind of make sense? And is that yeah. what you imagined it at to an extent? Well, this is all interesting to hear because it's like you write in a silo. Only people who've read the book so far is me and my co-author and and um, the person that did the indexing, right? Mm. Like, uh, so other than that, I don't, you know, I haven't really. I mean, and and the and the people who did the uh, blurb, oh, yeah. Okay. But but other than that, um, I haven't gotten a lot of audience feedback. So that's interesting to hear from that perspective. I think I think everybody will have a different perspective. I think for me. Um, just to kind of lay out the theory and kind of where I came, where I was, where I was going with it and just the, maybe the origin story of the book. So originally I wrote a set of essays called with the same title, Laundry and Black Rage. And that's basically chapter one and two, only there's more information and in, particularly in chapter one than there was in the original essays. Cause I just added stuff and put Over stuff time. back in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Put stuff back in that I took out as well. Um, and I was originally trying to understand how when George Floyd was murdered, I I had noticed this trend before then, but it was very ugly in 2020, seeing George Floyd gets murdered, people go out in the streets, and then I'm watching like someone who works at Chase get a get a raise or they're getting right. a, get a DEI uh, yeah. contract. Yeah, some black person who probably looks down on George Floyd too um, is getting a is getting a promotion or they're the executive or somewhere, or they're getting a consulting job at that, that place or, um, and just some of the random things corporations did. I was just going back over it the other week and Aunt Jemima got removed from pancake. Right. <laughs> and you just, and she was no longer on the label and it was now it just says uh, silver linings or some, uh, something. I don't even remember what it's called. Um, and that was all these just arbitrary things that were yeah. going to black people who were, the least likely to be killed by the police because that is a very class specific thing too. Mm -hmm. It's it's a gender specific thing if you look at the numbers, and it's a and it's a it's a it's an ability specific thing or a disability specific thing, right? A lot of yeah. people are neurodivergent or they're disabled in some way. They're poor, usually black males. When you just look at the statistics, yeah, behavioral health issues. That's right. my background. Like if you have if you are neurodiv, I don't remember the exact numbers, so I won't try to go too much into like specifics. But if you're neurodivergent and or have a behavior health disorder, such as schizophrenia, mm -hmm. um, bipolar, et cetera, you are X amount more times likely to get killed by the police um, yeah. while being unarmed or having like a screwdriver. You know what right. I'm saying? Yeah. Right. So those are the people who are getting killed. 
and they come from a specific community, communities that I've lived in and, and know about. And somehow that was turning into, you know, uh, Tony, uh, not Tony, he's a coach. What's the brother's name? Everybody got mad at Abraham Kendi. Yeah, Abraham, 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 Kendi. Abraham Kendi. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, so, uh, it, it, so it was like it was, but but also coming back to the poetry thing to just kind of connect it all. I was seeing this happening happening locally too, so mm -hmm. it wasn't just seeing it nationally, seeing the book deals, seeing the academic promotions, seeing the the more black people in movies and commercials. Like we all see that, but I was seeing it locally, where mm -hmm. you know there was rage in the streets, and their response by Indianapolis was to all of a sudden, as a black artist being in that field was to let us express our art in ways that we never got the money to do it prior. Mm -hmm. You know, right. so they so they all of a sudden there was a mural in the city that that everybody collapsed around and there was less protesting and more about the mural, right? Yeah. And then an organization formed in the city um to take to somehow harness that energy and go into the museums and present black artists to white people. And the, the even one of the grants that I won, like in the book I put myself in it because I don't want to make like I'm standing above it and not involved and my co-author does the same like i got a grant and part of that was was switched where 50 percent of the people that won that grant had to be people of color that was the direct response to george floyd and as well in our city dre john reed who was murdered like earlier that month right mm. so i'm seeing that happen but at the same time i'm watching that rage like dissipate mm -hmm. and become more about oh i'm just i'm just being successful and black right, right. and i'm seeing right. But I'm like, okay, at the same time, I know that's not simply just I, something I can just put on black people yeah. and just be like, oh, we're just sellouts and that's the end of it. There's clearly something broader, like bigger going on that's that's pushing that kind of agenda and we're just buying into it. Um, but it's but it's but the the trick is it still seems like that's the same rage that burns the building down, that feeds the people etc like it, that's the trick because you're like okay i'm black but i'm at this museum that they never let us into so we're winning but what is yeah. that really doing for what most is that really doing for, right yeah and so it's, would, yeah it's, it's it's almost like you look at uh you know the uh, what is the law the third law of thermodynamics whenever whatever these galaxy laws is i don't remember the exact term but basically like mass is not created or destroyed it's just altered and so, law of conservation, I believe. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Law of con I knew it was, yeah. I knew it sounded better than what I was giving. I'm gonna just edit that part <laughs> out. So, in, a, in Newton's third law of conservation, um, the energy that is generated from those horrifying experiences of a George Floyd out here, Ahmaud Arbery, he had actually been murdered months before, but I think the tape had been released. And that's how like, I opened the. Yeah, that's how yeah. it opens with me by talking to my sisters. Like I watched a nigga get killed. And, oh yeah, and he was like, "Which one?" Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Basically, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I thought she was talking about Ahmaud Arby, but then it's like, "Oh, somebody just went on Facebook Live. This is Dre John Reed, and he gets killed." Right. So I was like, "Oh, I thought you were talking about that." So we had to like clarify it. But it, yeah, yeah. And, then, and I think that same week is a dude in, in Central Park that didn't get killed, but the white woman was like, "I'm gonna call the police on you because of the dog, the bird mm -hmm. watching dude." So like, mm -hmm. all that happened within the same like, you know, two week time span. So that translates complacency into rage because the energy is still there. We all feel it on a regular basis, right? The rage burns down police precincts. I, I don't know how many it was, but like across the the, the country, a handful, nice, a nice amount, you know what I'm saying? And then the, the then you extract the most capable and most uh, susceptible to um, extraction to say, all right, let's translate this rage into action. But the action is black business grants, mm -hmm. museum uh, space, mm -hmm. by black, uh, by yeah. you know, by black, etc. And like, I'm not gonna sit up here and um, I'm not I'm not going to act like I haven't also looked at envy as some of those grants once upon a time. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Or worked in nonprofit, worked in the nonprofit industrial complex. Um, but I also can't lie and say, uh, when, cause I, I'm, I'm from, I live down the street from, uh, where Richard Brooks is murdered. Um, and I remember the sense of dread and fear when they burned that plate, when they burned that Wendy's thing, cause I could see it from my crib. Um, and I also saw the little white kid, white kids, way too many white kids. That was never in my neighborhood. That's, a, that's mm. a, another part of the conversation. So it, well, I'll say that to say it becomes an easy 
switch in your head to say, well, surely burning down the Wendy's isn't good. So maybe we can do these grants. Maybe we could have more representation um, in these spaces that change minds, et cetera. But you kind of illustrate how big and how longstanding this kind of bait and switch methodology is. Cause you go from, um, uh, you know, that some, the summer of 2020 to way back to slavery, uh, way mm. back to co the col colonialism. Mm. And you kind of speak to this as capitalism, essentially they're like part of their trick bag. It's like, mm. all right, we, we've, we've colonized these people. We can't just take all the things and run. We have to set up certain mechanisms to allow for the persistent and continual extraction. And I can't remember who, whose theory this is, but when I hear you talk about, you know, the people are burning things down in the street, so we have to give them something else to do is essentially what it comes down to, which is we're describing from 2020. So and like, we can't give them what they actually want. Right, right. Yeah. So we're going to give them every corporation in the world had a statement between, mm -hmm. I don't know, June of 2020 and September of 2020, like every single mm -hmm. last one. Uh, and most of them were, well, not, well, not most, all of them were mostly bullshit. Um, my wife works in worked in corporate America and they tried to give her a DEI uh, position. She was a salesperson, but she was the only black person. So it was like, hey, you're black, do some DEI. She was like, eh, I don't do that. Right. That's not hire a real DEI person. Right. Y'all not gonna do nothing with it anyway. And here we are four years later, and most of that shit is those grants have run up and not been renewed. You know what I mean? So I'm sorry, I rambled, but like Yeah, yeah, I, I think. Go, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I want, I want to, I want you to jump in. Yeah, I think the, I mean, first, like, so the general theory is, like I said, those are what I, what I opened with was just like these are my observations. Like, this is what develops the research question. Like, how do you go from George Floyd's neck to your wife getting the DEI? How do you go from George Floyd's neck to someone getting a grant? How do you go from George Floyd's neck? Like, what is the because to me, these things have really nothing in common on the surface. Like, I don't think George Floyd's being killed has anything to do with some black elite person getting a job or getting a promotion or or uh, the Super Bowl being hip hop, you know, because that's that's just what black people want to hear. Or Jay-Z saying we're beyond kneeling or what I don't right. I don't think these things actually are correlating at all. Right. So but like on the surface. So it's like, well, what is the relationship between these things? How does that happen? And then how is it not, how, not only does, how does it happen, but how is it championed by us in many cases? Mm -hmm. How is it something that we see as progress? <laughs> how does it, how does that duping happen to that point where that rage seems like it's the same? So that's why that, like laundering comes in, not, a, not as a metaphor, but really we understand it more as a governing device, as a means of governing people. Mm -hmm. So when we think about the idea of laundering, like, in and of itself, most people think that's like a drug dealer or something, right? Like I'm gonna, I I sold I sold crack. Let's use the most stereotypical story. I sold crack, <laughs> and I Open make up money. A car wash, right? And I'm yeah, I make money from my crack, and I need to be able to spend my money. So I can't justify for people who don't know. There's like rules for these things. Like you can't put more than ten thousand dollars in the bank without the government checking in. Things of that nature. So how do I clean my money? How do I make it where I can spend it as a normal quote unquote citizen? That's the general rule. So let's take something that is illegitimate and making it look legitimate. Mm -hmm. That's the general rule of, of laundering. But when I was thinking about that rule, I'm like, what makes something legitimate? Mm -hmm. Like, what is what is it that legitimizes the thing that um, says this is OK to do within a quote unquote open society versus what makes it illegitimate? Who has the authority to say that? You know, so I'm like, okay, the United States is saying that I'm a, I me as a drug dealer or me as some kind of so-called criminal is the one that is the, that, that is somehow doing things illicitly or illegally. But I was like, what does it mean to conquer people and then legitimize that as a country? Right. Right. You know, one of the like, funniest, what is <laughs> quick aside, one of the funniest things that has come out in the, in the uh, Palestine genocide in the moment is hearing liberals try to refute the idea that Palestinians were there by saying like, well, the Great Britain gave the land to, they didn't, the Palestinians didn't want the land from Great Britain. So they gave it to Israel. And it's like, how was it their land in the first place? Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. you can't, it doesn't work. You yeah. know, it, it legitimizes the conquest to begin with. 
Right. That's a great example, I would say, uh, according to like how your theory works of laundering, because that's the that's a conquest that happened. And like we're we're worried about Israel, which you know, rightfully so. But we haven't even got to the Great Britain's conquest of the of the land in the first place. Right. Like that right. would have to happen three steps later. You know, right. right. The First World War, um, pretty much breaking up the old Ottoman Empire, uh, you know, like. Yeah, it's like, but so conquest becomes the first act. This that's technically the first criminal act. Mm -hmm. But instead of just saying this is a country of, or this is just this is just conquest, just calling it what it is. You know, you have to launder that conquest, so you set up fronts. Right. And that becomes the United States and all mm -hmm. the different entities that come under the United States. So it's the tax codes, the the governmental infrastructures, the businesses. All those things become fronts to legitimize the conquest. Right. And it's not again, this is not abstract. Like if we know in the book with Walter Rodney and such, you take money from or you take resources from this place, you know, that you've raided and then you take those resources, send them somewhere else in the world, refine them. And then you build buildings that you stole from someone else. And then you steal people and right. bring those people to come work at those and on those plantations, on those sites, on those farms. And that legitimizes your conquest. And you come up with all this all this justification for the white man's burden and all these manifest ideas destiny that, yeah manifest destiny all these things that that rationalize it so then after a certain time the people that you've conquered are stuck fighting against the fronts mm -hmm. not the actual conquest to your point they're mm -hmm. just saying oh we want equal rights within the fronts that you've already constructed on top of the conquest but the ultimate conflict, the ultimate contradiction is the conquest and then the maintenance of conquest, right? So so we're saying black rage at its core grows from that contradiction, grows from the conquest of a people. And then all the things that's put in front to justify the conquest are the things that rage often gets funneled into, the discrimination, the brutality, the poverty, et cetera. But at the core, the fundamental reason why we're in any of this it's because we've been conquered. Yeah. We never really get to get to that point, right? So so black rage is an inevitable outcome because you can't oppress people and expect them to never respond. So there's always a resistance movement. There's always some kind of pushback and black rage grows from that. And since the state understands that, since capital understands that, you have to create means to, to launder that and to convert that rage into things that benefit you. Because mm -hmm. if that rage is able to like get outside of your perimeters, It'll, it'll end you yeah. because there's more of them than there is of you. So you always have to, so you, what do you do? You, you bribe people that comes back, you know, so you, here's a job so you right. can take care of yourself. You know, here's a grant, <laughs> right. Here, right? Here's a promotion. Here's a look, here's yeah. a president. Um. Right. Right. <laughs> and it, and it's usually going to break down on class lines. So we use like bell hooks and she talks about the difference between the militant rage and the narcissistic rage and the militant rage is the rage of the masses who want a different world. Mm -hmm. And the narcissistic rage is the rage of the black elite who are angry that they're not being, you know, integrated mm -hmm. into the empire. Mm -hmm. So you have to convert that militant rage, which is the, which is the rage that burns the police precinct precinct to the more narcissistic rage, which is the grant. I deserve the more. Job. I'm right. I'm right. Know. But you might, what you want it to look like, it's all the same because you flatten it. It's just, it's just black people or, yeah. and you can fill in any other group. We studied black people, but you could honestly apply this theory in different ways because every group has its own historical thing or character, but you could apply it to other groups as well. Cause you see this all the time. And we name those groups. We name, we yeah. talk about Ireland. We talk yeah. about India, you know, so it's to show that this isn't just, us right that's just who we chose to study but it's the but, same process yeah i'm in community with a lot of queer people from my audience and like other creators and that's a a, a thing they're really struggling with um recently because of how white queerness is in america mm -hmm. which means like there's just such an easy jump <laughs> you know right into um you know lepers eating my face party you know like so it's it's a it's a very it's a very insightful uh, framework that I think is really useful because, and, and so I took from it that particular, the the analysis I just presented earlier, because that's where I'm at in my political development, where I mm -hmm. am coming out of um, a talented 10th upbringing, right? Where uh, I had conversations with my father recently um, my father and my mother were both involved in Chicago 
radical politics uh, for a time, my mother especially. Um, and uh, my father, uh, my grandfather ran with Paul Robeson. It's something I found out a couple of years mm -hmm. ago. You know what I'm saying? And so like, but my, my father and my grandfather also were petite bourgeois. You know what I'm saying? They were, they were black, they were black elites. And so when I asked my dad, who was there at the time, like, hey, when things start to break down, why didn't more people, you know, stay stay close to what Stokely, uh, at the, I think, was, was he still Stokely Carmichael at the time? He might have been, but uh, uh, Kwame Ture. If he, was, if he was still in the United States before he left, yeah, he was still Stokely. Yeah, so this is still the 60s and, and 70s. Okay. So yeah. um, I was like, well, why didn't more people ride with where he was going at that time? Like, what happened? What's the schism that maybe we don't understand or miss? He's like, my dad was like, niggas was broke. It was that simple. He was like, they didn't have no money. We was getting jobs. We were getting money. And my dad got a computer programming job. And my mom, you know, got several other degrees and got started working within the government. Um, and my aunt, uh, who was another kind of local uh, activist legend, um, started getting her grants and started her nonprofit. And, and don't get me wrong, like there's good, important work being done by a lot of these, these industries. The nonprofit I work for worked in anti-sex trafficking. We're literally pulling girls off the street. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like somebody needs to be there to do that. But I also left because I recognized that there were certain things I couldn't say or do. Well, I was put out. Let me, let me keep it real. I was I was I was pushed out because I was bumping heads with our, our executive director because there were certain things girls needed that I couldn't give them, even though I had access to it, because funders wouldn't abide by that type of activity. And who um, are the funders? And who are the funders? Now I remember going to our our yeah. big funding event, and it was all white people, these rich white Republicans from Atlanta suburbs that were cutting checks at a dinner like it was nothing. And we were auctioning off, you know, Falcons jerseys and stuff. And I'm like, wow, this is really surreal. This is like the Hunger Games, you know what I'm saying? And like, of course, we're going to use this money to, again, pull some little girls or even some little boys off the street. But this feels, this feels like an incomplete our response to the problem you know and that that's what we were we were getting at something else we were getting at like when we make this point i think sometimes people are like oh because i'm the worst person ever and i know you're not saying that but i'm like yeah. that's part of why it's, i talk about like noticing it with people like no because it forced me to not be so like flipping on the just the label people sell out some people are yeah but i even think sellout is a material manifestation of broader issues it's not just a moral failure yeah. um but the but fronts and even when we go back to how we originally understand like laundering that not within the broader con conquest angle but even just the original one Front still do a good front still does what it says it does. Yeah. Even if it's selling drugs in the back, the front of it. I can still get my car washed in yeah, the front. Yeah. <laughs> right. So 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 people become dependent on it because it does do something. It's not like it's all fake. Right. That's the trick, is it does give you something you need to live to the point about jobs and money and security and stability. Like all of those things are things that the state gives you you know, that you need to to reproduce yourself, to to take care of your children. But that's still a bribe, mm -hmm. even though even though the front does things that we really need. That's the that's the trick like that's and we all want stability on some level, you know, so we're going to fight for it. But like, I think I quote uh, Dr. James, she talks about how, you know, like as you stabilize yourself, you're also stabilizing the predatory structure. So as you stabilize yourself, you're you're still like creating a stability for the state, for empire, for capitalism. Right. And and you also are going to form like like Rasul talks about, like we form the taste of capital the more we move up the chain. You know, we 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 get more familiar with those things and then we start policing people on those things. Right. Because we become more familiarized with it. Right. And then it just be, creates this this chain effect. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the that's the trick of it is not that you don't need these things. Like I think something that was referenced in chapter five was um, from the book uh, Black Against Empire. They made a point about why the Black Panthers declined. And there was like a lot of people point just to repression like the COINTEL Pro program and stuff. And that's definitely a major part of it. But another part is just affirmative action programs. You know, yeah. the end of the Vietnam War, the end of the or, or the end of the draft, more specifically before the war, the end of the draft. 
you know, um, people just because you know, the point was to show that you don't take this revolutionary route because you can go get a job here because there yeah. is a chance in America because yeah. there is opportunity. Right. But the funny thing is, it's the rage that creates that opportunity. Mm -hmm. If people didn't burn the shit down, if people weren't willing to go the revolutionary route, that concession never happens. <laughs> so, like, is, yeah. So is the is the move the who who who's the who said forever revolution, the eternal revolution, the eternal struggle? One of these people. But basically, kind of what you just said to me is is a uh, idea I've been percolating on a lot, which is that we're probably looking at protracted. Reg, uh, protracted re re reproducing uh, cycles of burn shit down till we get more stuff, like yeah. over and over and over again. Uh, unless you know, of course, there uh, or I should say, I won't say burn shit down till we get more stuff, but agitate till we get more stuff until you know. I don't know if that ever completes the dismantling of the system, um, but it it looks like progress to the, to the, to the, to the layman. You know what I'm saying? That's how those murals work. When I, there's a mural at like my kid's school, you know what I'm saying? And like, so our school uh, serves uh, a large chunk of, of lower income kids, a large chunk of, you know, petite bourgeois, black and white kids. Um, I don't know what that mural looks like to them, but it indicates progress. And so when the next thing happens, do we say, hey, one less mural, two extra, uh, two extra housing complexes for people to actually live in? You know what I'm saying? Like, what is the, what is a solution or a response to this cycle that seems like it's been going on over and over? Yeah, well, one is like, um, you, you really have to be organized because something I was also thinking about in my co-op that like the we both talk about is people often get caught. And that's why in chapter two, there's phases, right? So mm -hmm. the incubation phase, well, I'll lay it out because it's not like anybody else read the book, but the, <laughs> the, there's the incubation phase, the labor phase, and then the commodity phase. Incubation phase is like, when we talk about conquest and all the slaughter that comes with it, all the contradictions that are created, that that create that that incubate your rage to the point where it actually rises up to to where you do burn something or you do act out and even if it's not because again we're not saying rage is only violence either it can be either it can be nonviolent violent you know however you perceive it um, but there's a phase and that the incubation phase where your rage is 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 building up where you finally reach a point and where the people kind of collectively reach that point that's most days. <clears throat> Then we talk about the labor phase where people actually rise up and do the thing that we watch on TV or that we read about in history. That's actually very few days. Mm -hmm. And then after, and then and then the commodification phase is once that rage has been has risen up in the streets, that's how he breaks it up and it gets converted into a commodity because it's we say it's a form of labor because people actually go out and do things that create a social capital that the state could then exploit. Mm -hmm. Um but that incubation phase is is really like most days it's at work. It's the from the microaggression to the to the wage theft to the you know to right. to not getting the the to the credit denial or whatever it is. That's the profiling, the funny look on, yeah. the, on the street. Yeah. yeah. The stop and frizz. And so that's where the organizing yeah. happens. Yeah. So that once we get to the the combustibility of um the second two phases, mm -hmm. once we get to the commodity, they can't pawn off, they can't pull out a couple of Ibram X candies. Um, and a couple of uh, what's the sister that ran BLM and say, all right, here's some checks. Go ahead, get your folks. <laughs> and if they do, and if they do, we just don't mess with them because right. that's the thing about the the civil rights movement. Uh, and we talk about in chapter five is from the the funders realized like the civil rights leaders weren't cool anymore. Mm. Like they just mm. realized like nobody really rocks with them like that. They like black power, so we need to go figure out how to co opt that. Mm. <laughs> but. But even in the fact that even with all those contradictions, that still will force more concessions. Again, the goal is not concessions, but right. being realistic in some cases, unless like unless you can literally seize the means of production, you're you're going to be dealing with some kind of negotiation. So you want to be airtight as much as possible. And there mm -hmm. are examples of that in history, like even going back to Haiti. Um, we talk about how the original thing plan of the French was to just give free people of color um, all the rights. And so they can manage that's one of the it. illest things I yeah. learned in, in my I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The illest thing I learned in my political development was uh uh freaking uh not the, what's the brother's name? He gets way more clout now. I realize he's way 
I realize now, like I said, oh, it's a perfect example what you're talking about. So you got Desai and you got, well, I can't, I can't even remember his name now. Talking about over, uh, talking Overture. About Tucson, yeah. And you uh, talking over, about Desalini? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's like when you, when I was uh, listening to uh, Pascal um, over This Is Revolution talk about yeah. Him, yeah. He was like, yo, if you go talk to people in Haiti, they don't fuck with Overture. And I'm mm -hmm. like, what? But that's yeah. like, that's the man, ain't he? And they're mm -hmm. like, nah, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you read that history and you see what really happened. And Overture gave away the game when they had the, when they had the upper hand. And, and when I looked at that, I was like, oh my God, this yeah. is the most like biggest unforced error I've ever, I don't know if there's ever been one like that in history. Um, and but I, the and people, but the people were strong enough to where they were still able to get their their freedom relative to that time because right. they were like, we're not rocking with that either, right? Like, <laughs> so, and that's what I'm saying. Like, if the people, that's part of why we went so hard on the on the black elite and the class contradiction because if you can see that if Beyonce putting up the flag, I know I'm gonna get in trouble, whatever, is not something that you are gonna defend automatically, you know, but you're actually at least at least skeptical of. <laughs> you know, then that means that the people have arrived at the consciousness where even when they send someone like that out to do it, we're not phased by yeah, it. Like, like right. bring, you know, like, and Malcolm, Malcolm talks about how black people had arrived at a certain political maturity that when white folks came to the community pro making promises, you know, around election time, we all knew like, all right, all right. but they'll send a black person and we still ain't there to yeah. be like, eh, you know, so you know like, you're full of shit too. You know, we know yeah. you're coming with this with, with a specific message. Right. Yeah. And that's, I, I tend to see that as where we are in general, um, culturally speaking. I, I feel like part of me, when I see like, say, uh, Books Riley with an Amazon deal, right? Mm -hmm. So part of me is skeptical. We talk about Amazon. But part of me is also like, if Books Riley, if, if, if a company like Amazon uh, feels the need to pull out a Boots Riley to, you know, to sell his wares, that does mean we've shifted, there's, I don't know, Overton window uh, to the point where certain ideas, while still, you know, under the co-option of these big tech corporations, are now being normalized in the population. And that, to me, that speaks to opportunity and change and growth in the collective consciousness. Now, you know, I... <laughs> Uh, I hear I can hear uh, Dr. Ball talking about the Vernon philosophy in the back of my head um, mm -hmm. for saying that. But I, I feel like there's opportunity there when we have just certain discourses being much more common. And when you think about where collectively black political power, black rage has been, I will say from from that affirmative action, from the Warren Court era to now. They had a good run on us. They had all of us rapping for the black brass ring, um, you know, all the black excellence jargon, all the talented tenth without the later essay. Like all of that has been so normal. And now Jay-Z feels the need to defend himself as a capitalist versus mm -hmm. 10 years ago, it was just H to the Izzo. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so like I try to, I try to look at that as as a a, a beacon of hope, of mobility and movement away from certain ideas and the opportunity to reintroduce ideas that have been hidden and lost in that in in that last you know in the last 40 50 years since that era um but i also try not to get too caught up in that because i also recognize that benefits me as a creator and a purveyor of these ideas mm -hmm. you know so yeah, this there's, is, go ahead. there's a there's a tolerance of those ideas that the, that the state will be willing to concede now there's the other side of this when we're and we're seeing this today where okay there's one side of it that's like all right here's a bribe here's you know you can you can hear boots or somebody on amazon you know and it's not that's not even a knock on boots i'm just talking about like that's the way the general structure works but then on the other end is okay the 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 particularly for the right wing oh y'all want to let these ideas out um, mm -hmm. Y'all want to put this on screen, so now we're gonna attack you. <laughs> now yeah. we're gonna take away. We're gonna take away what was already a front anyway. We're gonna take that away, <laughs> and we're gonna mm -hmm. attack people who are part of those fronts. Mm -hmm. We're gonna take the strip away the little bit of concessions that you have, and then we're gonna use it as a means of repression. So black right. rage becomes both things, right? It becomes a means to pacify people, but also a means to repress people as well. Like we can never forget the more violent side yeah. of the state too. You have and that whole chapter on Dylan Roof where, mm. and so because that was the last thing I read and I had to read it this week to, to make sure I was ready. 
I, I wasn't as so help me help me further understand how that fits into the equation. So is that kind of what you're getting at that by as we as we put on display these these monuments to you know black perseverance um mm -hmm. and struggle, you also kind of, that also fuels the the mask off, you know, like willing to to kill white supremacists to hit the streets and kind of re reinstate the same type of fear and terrorism that was normal 60 years ago again today is that like like give me a, a better breakdown and then i was able to get of that uh, yeah. particular chapter yeah that was the last chapter that was by my co-author uh and that was laundering white violence we just wanted to have something that dealt specifically with white violence and that because you know often in criticism and i think it's sometimes fair is you know the left will get really focused on the criticism of identity politics and all the co-optation but it's like you know there are truly just fascists out here who are who do want to kill you mm -hmm. and we can't not talk about that you know mm -hmm. if, if even if it doesn't appear as sophisticated so we were trying to deal with that and again he wrote that chapter but he's a he's a leisure studies scholar which is not a very well-known leisure field. studies yeah leisure studies um and it studies the science of leisure and he's very critical of leisure he actually had he actually has written about how lynching was leisure for white people. Mm, that uh, makes, I, I've said that same thing. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's ill. Yeah, I'm going to have to yeah, look into that. Cause I, yeah. you, when you look at, when you look at uh, race, not racism, the system of racism, but just the best way I could describe it is that every six weeks, some teenage white girl says like hard ER on the internet. You know what I'm saying? On Omegle or on TikTok. Like every mm -hmm. six weeks, there's a teenage white girl that does something overtly racist as a joke on the internet and gets drug and outed, you know, all through TikTok and Black Twitter or whatever else. And like, I've been seeing this since the, two, the mid 2000s. Since the internet has allowed us to communicate the video, that's been happening. And it's the same response every time. I'm not racist. It was a joke. I have black friends, whatever. And what you recognize is within some of these white spaces, racism is almost like a bonding practice. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's it's yeah. a matter of like, I am willing to do this violence against black people. Are you? Yes, well, we can be friends. And so through that, it's desensitized from the consequences of that activity, both the consequences that we face from it, but also the consequences of social ostracism. Because if white people want love, one thing is to find and chastise the other white races. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The one that's masked off with it. Yeah, um, and there's a sense that, and that's that's the problem when you don't deal with that side. And that's why I do appreciate that chapter, even though I admit it probably is a little more challenging than some of the other ones, because it it's like, okay, these tourism things are created supposedly to educate people on this really flawed premise that, racism is just a function of ignorance mm. and that white supremacy is a function of just not knowing better and that if people are introduced to these histories that they can you know reform themselves and be less racist or anti-racist right. or something but so he demonstrates to, for people again because no one's read the book it's not out yet so like for people he, he uses dylan roof who killed the nine people um, down in um, I'm South black Carolina? At, yeah, South Carolina killed the nine people at the church that Denmark Vesey was a part of, you know, allegedly. Um, so when Dylan, when Dylan Roof killed um, nine people, he was a white supremacist, killed nine black people, I believe, at the um, Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, but but Dylan Roof traveled before this, and this is what the chapter deals with to yeah. different sites of like um like ancient plantations and and different civil rights markers and and markers of slavery that are made in the and cuz he's all cuz um uh, Rasul also is in the tourism industry so he so he studies tourism and the and the and the pitfalls of it so these things are made and sold like they're fronts that sell this progress narrative you can come and learn about slavery you can have people doing reenactments on some of these plantations yeah that was wild like that. that that part yeah. was <laughs> but but Dylan Roof used this to gas himself up to prepare himself to go kill nine people yeah. at, a, at a black church. So what does that say about these things? Yeah. yeah. And, and these are in southern states specifically who don't care, who really don't give a shit about black people. But they right. make money off the tourism dollars because you can send some kids there to learn about slavery. But what, what does it say about people who 
like that particular side of things that gets gassed up and and is and is inspired because like he says in the piece dylan roof is not a remarkable person he's very mediocre there's nothing yeah. special about this man but he, he, he wasn't he pictures. wasn't mentally unwell he yeah. has not changed his opinions he has not repented mm -hmm. or recanted that's, that's that's something people don't know a lot of the the spree shooters of a different ilk because you know that was one of my stud areas of expertise so most spree shooters are of different of a different ilk that are not ideologically driven uh tend to feel bad after it's all over most of them, the vast mm. majority of them. um mm. the ones that are politically driven they see their acts as political uh you know, acts of political uh, revolutionary violence. Yeah, and in this and case, he, it's to provoke a race war. Yeah, that's what he wanted to do. It didn't. It didn't happen. But, mm -hmm. but that that genre of of white supremacy is is always looking to escalate things. Like, how yeah. can we? How can we force? How can like just like we talk about on the left about heightening contradictions? That principle applies to anything mm -hmm. on the yeah. on the negative or positive side. Mm -hmm. So you can heighten contradictions to where. The white liberal now feels the need to embolden, embolden to go out and fight, or even the conservative feels that they can now go shoot up, you know, some 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 Dollar General in Buffalo. Yeah. Like your your goal is to embolden those things. So it's like, what does it say about the white vigilante specifically, who is always on the hunt to to eliminate the brute? So Black Rage again becomes a, a match for them because to them, when they see those uprisings, oh, we got to put them down. Yeah. And the this state is, allows that. This is that exactly that. what we've been looking for. Yeah. You, you can go to Katrina yeah. and like how in the aftermath of Katrina, they were murdering black folks just walking through town um, on some, you know, classic sundown town shit uh, from their buildings. What that brings to me, kind of again, bringing it back partially to like this, you know, online political entertainment, video essayists, you know, left to space is the, the feedback loop that is this type of content, especially for, not just for white audiences, but also for, for those black elites where, in my last video, I talked specifically about the manosphere, but I bring up the point that the recommendation system for these algorithms, for these mm. tech companies, um, they reward rage engagement. If I can make something that makes you angry then I am doing a good thing, regardless of what it is. I'm doing a good thing because angry viewers watch more. And it's easy to predict um, what's going to piss somebody off versus what's going to bring someone pleasure. You know and what I'm I remember saying? you saying that's why those videos are are like money makers. They 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 they're cash cows. I could I could yeah. easily if I wanted to, I could, you know, I could predictably beef with people on a regular basis and we just be going, there's some people that's what they've been doing. That's what they've been doing for the last four or five years. You know, people that I like once I, I got into a, a conflict with a couple of these people. And once I saw the play, I was like, I need to stop engaging with these motherfuckers because this will end up being what I do here. And I don't want to do that. And I'm too old for this shit. But um, but the re the reason for that, though, is I think a really interesting um detail that your theory kind of illustrates it, it, even here with Dylan Roof, which is that. It's the emotional catharsis of engaging with these ideas or with these histories or with these political um, movements that kind of allows people to, to, to pass the rage on to the next cycle, right? So it's like, I, I've been at protests, you know what I'm saying? I, I haven't thrown any bricks or rocks, but I've been at protests. I've been, at, I, w I was in Jenna, you know what I'm saying? I, I've done these things before. And once you're done in the street, you feel like you did a thing. You feel like nobody can critique you for not being a part of the solution, especially if you were one of the elites, if you were one of the people whose skin isn't fully in the game. So I mm -hmm. can go, I can hit the streets with y'all real quick, and then I can go back to my crib. I can go back to my job on Monday. And and in not heightening that contradiction, it kind of allows for that that middle that you know what I'm saying that middle that that sorry that end stage the commodification is where it comes from because then once I've done that a couple of times when somebody approaches me with a grant I'm like yeah I deserve this I yeah. did the work and that's the and that's how it's successful is not when it has to be forced on you but when you actually demand for it that's the mm -hmm. scary part is if mm -hmm. you're demanding 
the thing that they want to give you in the first place. That's, so it doesn't even require any kind of conspiracy. Like we try to debunk that part of it too. It's just yeah. like, okay, if I have money and I don't want my shit to be burned down, I'm definitely going to pay the person that it just wants to do a nice poem versus the person who wants reparations or something. Like it's right. just logical, you right. know what I'm saying? Or right. I'm going to pay the people who are going to do the the recommendations for reparations more than the people who don't want to go through that stage. They've yeah. already made their recommendations. It's either give it or don't, right? So it's just logical. I'm going to fund the least threatening thing. Like it's yeah. not even really, you know, and, and yeah, now to some extent I have to, if I'm a funder, I have to gauge is this least threatening thing popular enough where other people are going to buy into it. So I'm not mm -hmm. going to fund something that's so, you know, out of, out of style that it's just going to piss more people off. Right. And sometimes you see that. And those are usually things we react to when <laughs> somebody does something. Force. Yeah. With something. That? Yeah, or something clownish like um, when um, Walmart was selling Juneteenth um, shit or whatever. Like those are the things that most of the people would be like, "Oh, they're commodifying blackness." I'm like, blackness was commodified way before, well, before that got that. on the shelf. Yeah. So that's you know. <laughs> so I'm like, but don't, but when they do something clumsy, mm -hmm. then we're like, ah oh, ha ha. You see the Twitter jokes, but when it's not clumsy, y'all are really we really fall. It's real. It's yeah, y'all really took want that. Yeah, <laughs> and and that's the tough thing though because the desire for that I think comes from a genuine place. Um, what my next video, I'm using the video literally, it just released five minutes ago, in fact. Uh, oh, wow, that's uh, I had I to set up. you stop doing lives now. You don't, you don't do a premiere. No, no, yeah, this is this is all, yeah, yeah this is going to the, the podcast joint. Um, I'm talking about the you don't do premieres. Oh, live premieres, yeah, yeah, the premieres, uh, it it waters down the we got to talk. <laughs> I, I, I had a, I had, I, I hit uh, Dr. Ball up and um, I talked to a bunch of people about like the YouTube game. Um, just little stuff I'm still learning. Uh, but anyway, fucking my next video is on kid and play. Mm. And I may end up rewriting just a little bit to add some of your, this, uh, this, uh, I may, I may name drop you in this book to the kid and play joint because one of the, the, the like core takeaways I want people to get from it is that like, so you remember kid and play, you know, how to you know, house party, house yeah. party, et cetera. Most people remember house party. What people don't realize is that kit and play were kind of like the first industry plants at an early era of hip hop. Um, they weren't really interesting plants, but they came off like that because like kid and play are hot at the same time as art, uh, rock Helm and KRS one and NWA real hip hop. Right. And I remember being there, not being quite old enough to, to ice, cube, it. ice cube, dissed them actually ice cube, dissed them, loop, dissed them. <laughs> Right. Because they were like fake. But think about what you just said. Ice Cube dissed them. So Q, if, if, if there's a captured Negro archetype, Ice Cube fits the bill. At the time, though, if you would have asked real hardcore hip hop heads, they'd have said, yo, real hip hop won. You know what I'm saying? The real rap won. NWA, Ice Cube, all those dudes won because it was kid and play in that genre of like pop fun rap that kind of died mm. going into the 90s and it was all the real shit. But the real shit wasn't even real. <laughs> and yeah, and what, yeah. you, what you realize is that yeah. the corporations was playing both sides of the equation yeah. to make sure they won regardless. And yeah. it just so happened that the air quotes real shit is what won. And I think that's like a perfect distillation of, of the challenge of where we are now in that we have enough we have enough of the words to point out the thing but we can't point it out unless it like you just said it kind of has a you play video games not as much uh, as i used to but yeah. so you, you know like the boss battle on mm. sonic or resident evil it's the glowing red thing you got to hit that to kill the boss and like so we can get that but if it doesn't if that doesn't pop up we don't know we can't recognize it. yeah we can we can call out beyonce with the american flag or the uh you know, Black Panther Super Bowl joint. Yeah, any anything that is is like I said, gross or just yeah. or anything that is in your is in your face. And then there's still people who would defend that, but there's at least a discourse about it, right? right. Like you can at least say that versus yeah. the average thing. There's no discourse. That's why I don't. I laugh at a lot of people who are like, "Well, what happened to all the 2020 money? Like you guys promised us." I'm like, the fact that you bought into that is part of is a problem oh, with problem. stuff. And yeah, lovingly, but, lovingly, because that's the other yeah, challenge too. Is because, yeah. and I've been trying to be better at this as well. And I've actually been telling myself I'm going to be more open to conversations. I don't like that conceptually. Like I'm not going to be mm -hmm. like, 
you know, uh, Breakfast Club interviewing interviewing Candace Owens, right? Like that's that was some yeah, bullshit. That's, that's that's more than a conversation. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah, that's a, yeah. anyway. But you get my point, though. It's like <laughs> right, right. It, it, we need to. Mm, I want to say this in a way that I I won't feel like backtracking at a later date when some fuck shit happens. But like, there's there's untapped value, not so much in approachability, but but in not making the brand of our politics call out politics mm -hmm. because even that call out politic that habit is very captured you yeah. know what i'm saying it's and so that's, e that's why we didn't we didn't approach it that way in the book like if people read the book yeah. we don't name a lot of names we name organizations we name you know entities that fund people and then there are people obviously that do pop up in that that we have to talk about Right. Um, I don't know if you also noticed that we never say the president's names. Yeah, I did. He's yeah. President Thirty Four, President Forty Four, yeah. <laughs> etc. Yeah, the point was kind of like it is. It doesn't really. It is. Matter. What, it don't really fucking matter. <laughs> <laughs> if it was Reagan or if it was Bush, if it was Reagan too, yeah. aka Obama. Yeah, like I think it's there's the same. one. Yeah, I think there's one part we did name Nixon, but other than that, it's the 40, 30, 34th president, thirty six. But but yeah, yeah it, it. But it's a good point because for me, because I had a real talking about black rage with the black elite coming into this mm -hmm. but trying to keep my materialist analysis as in like the material world dealing with it for what it is and understanding those contradictions and not putting it on not saying the prime problem is just the moral failures of people like i don't like to do that yeah. it doesn't, there aren't moral failures but the moral failures are a consequence of a broader structure so even when you do sell out it's not to defend the sellout at all it's just to say that the sellout doesn't just do it because they're just a bad somebody person. had to buy yeah there's a so drive the buyer right there's a driving force behind it so we have to always understand that so it's like, that's why i was saying, saying earlier the fronts serve real needs so it's not oh it's just fake it's like no that's why it works because it does do things that 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 we do need on some level it does give you those things but the the trick if you're looking for not necessarily a flat out solution because we said in the book like that's stuff that people need to figure out organizationally but the trick is all of these things still got to pass through our hands mm -hmm. like at the end of the day there's only a few billionaires there's only a few capitalists like real capitalists, real capitalists yeah. you know there's a lot of middle people but there's only a few real capitalists um so once since this has to pass through your hands I mean, I do think to some level, and I'm not just saying this to gas you up, I do think you try to think about what kind of what I'm saying. We talk about reverse laundering. So reverse laundering is the opposite. So you take the legitimate thing to fund the illegitimate thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So like when we brought the Pendleton 2 to you and you were like, all right, I'll at least post it on the site. That's not the most revolutionary thing ever, but that's still, especially for a creator on your scale, that's not something that most people, because you're not the only person we email, to be fair. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, so, that's wow. so it's like, that just doing, just being like, okay, getting the story of political prisoners out there and helping us raise money and, you know, bring more awareness to the case, like, because, because you, because you do have an audience. So that means that if I have an audience, how can I funnel those resources to the quote unquote illegitimate things right? and not to legitimize it either, just to, just simply, to keep it going. Yeah. Just to yeah. fund it. Cause to legitimize it in some way is to commodify it. Right. Yeah. But to, and that's part of the problem. We're always trying to legitimize our radical acts. And it's like, let it, if you wanted to stay radical, stop trying to legitimize it under the state. Like that's yeah. part of the problem. That's part of the problem. So, so it's like, so, but since this stuff has to come through our hands, since the grants have to pass through, and even if we're not the ones receiving the grants, if we're on the lower level of, within the class dynamic, we're the ones that those grants are quote unquote made to serve. So it's like we can all be organized to 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 funnel some of those resources away. You know, like I remember one time I was talking with Dr. Ball. And we were talking. I think he was saying his uh his teacher James Turner said that you. The question is how can you make? I, I don't think I'm getting the numbers right, but it's the same point. How can you make a hundred thousand and live off sixty thousand, so to speak? Mm -hmm. But that's to say, like, do I need a hundred thousand hypothetically? to make this work or am I just trying to build generational wealth and make sure my kids have all the greatest things or can I take 40,000 and actually put it into something else that is that is more revolutionary even if I'm not going to be the one to actually pull the trigger quote unquote metaphor right. speaking right? right but it's so so it's like in the United States has done this on a much more evil scale that's how we get Iran that's, Contra you yeah. know and that's, the that's how we get South America 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so Israel, while we talking shit. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, but but it's just like, or you know, the militias that they fund to take you know diamonds or whatever. So it's like these are all things that the state does anyway. But I'm saying if they have to pass stuff through our hands, but we have to have the proper analysis to do that. If you still think that it's just representation, <laughs> then you're just gonna fund representation. You know, what yeah. I'm saying? if you yeah. still. But it's like there are times where I genuinely believe because this well, the 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 downside to an empire is it always overreaches. Overreaches, over, yeah. So it's not going to be to cover everything. So yeah. there are really spaces and enclaves where you can exploit because it can't cover and be there for everything. Yeah. But you have people who even they act like there's a gun on the other side of the door even when there's not. So they self censor. They mm-hmm. they don't even try to push things to its limitations. Yeah. So even if you are in a liberal space or whatever, are you pushing it to its limitations? Are you getting sent home from your job? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it's like, or are you just kind of going along to get along? You know, when sometimes I don't even think people will lose their jobs. Like I was talking to somebody after an event I had earlier this week and I was like, I'm never trying to tell y'all to be Malcolm X. I'm telling y'all the stuff you can do and still keep your job. And y'all don't even want to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. like, it's like, yeah. you, can do, you can do things that aren't always the most, Radicals. I don't really care about what radical is, other than that, that's one of the things. To do things. Yeah. Uh, what's the brother's name? He's the only person I don't think I've ever had a conversation with until this day. Dark skinned brother with locks, kind of like mine. A uh, higher pitched voice. Uh, it, Where is he way, from? I, I can't. Oh, he's a, he's in BPM, but I can't remember. I just can't remember his name up right now. Um, he's you talking, usually, about, talking about on Black Myths. He, no, no, no. On um, okay. wake up the um uh. The morning show, morning show. Um, first skin person with dreads, a, a, a male who maybe let me just look. I bet you they own now. <laughs> let me just go real quick and see. you talking about Geechee, Geechee, Geechee. I'm talking okay. about Geechee. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's not um, that, that's that's the earn your liberation. Yeah, they probably just finished and that's okay. <laughs> Geechee, <laughs> Geechee yeah. called because because one thing you know, it's a as you, I think one thing that probably gets people uh going when it discover these politics white black and otherwise is is revolutionary potential and you kind of imagine this glorious people's uprising with you know torches and pitchforks and shit and the reality is what the general reality is one this is kind of what Geechee gave to me is that the the there's so much capacity for revolution that does not require that fantasy space and when you when you position all revolutionary action as the fantasy uprising, you kind of end up doing some laundry. You and you infantilize saying? revolution, right? Like yeah. you infantilize it because you make it seem like it's just a gun or something. And it's like, again, if there's a scientific approach, then at having done my own organizing, um, it's always a question of what is effectively going to get us to our goal, right? right? It's not always just what's the most radical thing for the sake of the most radical thing. It's just often true that the most radical thing is the most effective thing on some way, shape or form, because it actually deals with the problem, but right. not, not for the sake of being radical or revolutionary, just for the sake of it. Because sometimes that thing that we might generally deem radical does not help us in this specific moment. It mm-hmm. might help us down the line. It might've helped us yesterday. Today, we don't need to do that because we have a goal in mind. Right. Now, our goal can be revolutionary. Our goal can be radical. But sometimes the steps and the tactics to achieve that are not always going to be the stuff that, you know, shows up on the news or right. somebody with a gun. Get you on a T-shirt. You yeah. Know? Like, can it, you run to, to go back to the to the to the poetry slam hotels to get the girls swooning at you like that? That man, he you know, it's it's the, the way that clout. Intersects with all of this in a modern sense. Although, mm-hmm. like, it's just as true then, I would argue, you know, I don't think you're able to do COINTELPRO if you don't have um, enterprising people that like the clout, that want the attention, or just want to get out of their own uh, uh, jam up situation. But now, especially as I as I am now a uh, a purveyor of the clout industry, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, you get those DMs and messages and say, man, you such a da 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 And, like, you hear that enough, you start to believe that shit. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly you do think, like, that's one thing I fight with people all the time. Like, like when I call myself an entertainer, it's not even a cop-out. 
it's to reposition exactly what I'm doing effectively for the audience I'm doing it to and for. Because if I allow you all to put me in the frame of mind of being more than an entertainer, I am literally the commodity. I, well, I, I'm already, I feel like all of this is already commodified. It's but then YouTube. I'm like, you know, it's YouTube. It's YouTube. Yeah. But then I'm really <laughs> hypercharging because I'm not even like challenging you to see outside of what 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 it is. I'm saying, yes, this is exactly what you exactly. The revolution starts here or FD signifies channel. Join my Patreon. Like I could do that shit. There's a lot of niggas that do do that shit. In fact, <laughs> but keep it there, yeah, 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 there really is. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and when you look at it with a critical eye, it sucks because their fan base, they they in it to win it for those people. I'm, I'm actually considering having that. I mean, we may circle back because we got to wrap up. We may circle back just for I, I was thinking about a video. Um, I'm going to block these names out about seed, about um, uh, and about mm -hmm. like the the commodification of hotel, the commodification of black of radicalism and how we go from that original black power uh, era in the late 60s to um, Kwanzaa, you know what I'm saying? And like what that what that process looks like, because I would I I foresee that we're we're as close to that moment as we've ever been in the last 50 years, although, of course, we're very far. Um, and so, like, I feel like the same play is about to be run. You know what I'm saying? Like, when I see Killer Mike get his Grammys, and, and, and like, that just seems odd to me. You know, when Killer Mike gets his Grammys and then starts popping up with more and more Republicans, I'm like, ooh, there, there's, a, there's a play coming around. Like, Killer Mike was talking about killing Ronald Reagan five years ago. How did he get here so quickly with, with, Similar rhetoric in his music, but not in his persona. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's I think I think there's been the fact that radical has become cool. Like I was saying earlier about legitimizing stuff. If if it is radical, then the point should not be to always re legitimize. Like, oh, I won the Grammy and I'm a radical, and I like what is that? That actually to me it sounds like a loss. If yeah. I'm a radical and I won the Grammy, so I'm, I'm proving radical. that radicals can be accepted. That's the point of being radical is not inclusion. That's mm -hmm. not the point. So it's like, there's become a problem, Be whether you're talking about people who get labeled as hotep. I try not to use that term anymore because I feel like it. there's a lot of good stuff that came from that, those communities that yeah. gets disparaged because of idiots. Or and, and that would kind of be the point of the video know? is to like, how do we reclaim the conceptual framework of what that was versus what it's become? Right. Know? And we'll also right. map out how they did it so that people can see the play when it comes again. Yeah, I, I I think even the characterization of that is a broader effect of COINTELPRO and mm -hmm. and and looking at and just narrowing it down to the kind of narrow pork chop cultural nationalist types, and then the rest of that world. It's just what, like, what the pork <laughs> chop got to do. <laughs> I just, I just, That's just I, her I've always heard that. I don't, I never actually looked up why we call them. I think it's just because it's pork, you know, and we, <laughs> pork has because they don't eat pork, and it's pork. Yeah, pork a, has that's a, like yeah. step one radical. Step exactly. one radical. Like, don't eat yeah. pork. So you don't know why it's so not your pork. Yeah. yeah. So if you're a pork chop nationalist, you've already become a contradiction because it's like you know white man's pork. You know Malcolm Nation Islam. You know, so it's like. um but I'm saying it's that wild. that characterization that we saw, and you kind of talked about it in the um in the video of um that you, where you talked about bamboozled, where that characterization of that, you know, because there was just a gap where a lot of those like a lot of those people were locked up or dead or whatever. So the so that becomes a kind of character that fills it in, you know. But I do think that you know that side gets a lot of criticism. I think there's criticism to go across the spectrum. There's a lot of um liberal feminism I, not feminism as a whole but a very liberal feminist point of view that actually appropriates some of that kind of yeah. rhetoric a lot of the you know quote unquote whole tep stuff and you know uses it to position some kind of like black girl boss thing yeah. and that becomes Across the radical feminism cheap. right right and that becomes the that becomes the thing that gets promoted you know and it's just radical because you are of a certain body and you're in a certain space and I think you just have this liberalization of everything where it's like, well, I can be myself and go in corporate America. And that's like a win for you. And it's like, that's that's what I was saying. And when you get to a point where you're you're like gleefully championing things like that, you've already been set in the wrong course. Like you because that's now become 
the thing that then sets a precedent for others. Like, well, I got tattoos and I can go in corporate America or I I got dreads. Or, and it's like, it's the, and we understand people do get discriminated against for those right. things. That doesn't inherently mean anything yeah. radical. We want people to feel good yeah. about themselves, but we don't want to dilute what that, what purpose that serves. You know what it I'm saying? It becomes mundane. I, there was, I was reading a critique and this is a conversation we probably have to have offline because, again, I know we got to go soon. But I was reading a critique of, um, and there's a good one on BPM about this, on Black Power Media, about the film American Fiction. Mm. Oh, uh, yeah, with, yeah, yeah. With, um, which, I, I saw it with um, Dr. Ball and uh, I don't remember the cat's name. I but, can't remember his name either. Dr. A, Ball was really feeling the movie and the cat was like, nah. Yeah, <laughs> it's a really great, I would recommend people watch. That was a great, yeah. great critique um, of the film and, and that and the, and the book, which I'm currently reading, is a lot better, as you per usual, yeah. uh, Erasure. But I was reading a critique of the film, and, and one of the things he got at was talking about how people want to make the mundane thing radical. And that's mm -hmm. one of the biggest problems of the Black elite is making the most mundane thing, the fact that you experience joy, right. a radical thing, the fact that you rest. A radical thing. The fact that you anything you do is supposed like if I'm black and I'm doing it and I'm not suffering, then it's just radical, right? So, right. but and the problem with that stuff is then whatever actually is radical, whatever actually does require sacrifice gets pushed down the line. Because of course, if you tell me it's radical to rest right. or to be happy or to go dancing one day or whatever, then why would I ever risk anything else? Mm -hmm. You know, those things are a means to get you back to the front lines. Like yeah. resting, joy, self care, but those things in and of themselves are just things. Yeah. <laughs> They're mundane, yeah. but there's this tendency. They're to also make easily commodified and, easily. and very great to build brands around. <laughs> very, yeah. very great to build brands around. The 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 pull of, um, if we can, I think this is maybe a good wrap up because it it kind of pulls in some of the, a, a lot of what you're talking about is low key selling out, and we don't call we won't we don't want to call it that because that's I think that's a flattening term. But you get you get my point. It's co-opting, mm -hmm. extraction, commodification. And so one thing I've been telling people who are making content and were asking me how I feel about, oh, what if I work with this sponsor? Do I should I join this, you know, space? Um, how do you feel about that? I always try to say on one end, make your money, stabilize yourself, you know, especially for people that's like really coming up, like they ain't got nothing, you know, before they get before they get a blow-up video and they're trying to like not go back to you know working fast food or uber right, right you know so like i'm like i'm never gonna tell people to not improve their material circumstance but i also remind them that selling out is a slow process like mm -hmm. we imagine um you know i imagine when i started getting going that i was just going to get invited to a meeting with a bunch of old white people and they were going to open up the suitcase and be like all right become a republican and we'll give you this suitcase and what it really is is this little this little option here this little opportunity there this you know move a little it's, bit in this direction on this message i always, I always say it's just class mobility man yeah. like the more you up the more your class position changes the inherently it doesn't mean everybody who grows up to get wealth is like a sellout quote unquote but class mobility is going to influence and this is really rob Sewell, my co-op dude talks about this like your tastes change as you move up the ladder. You have to adapt mm. to the spaces that you're in. And those things are, like you said, slow. Like, okay, we want to add on to the house. We want to, we need to meet these people. We need to hang around these type of people to, to maintain. We even we talk about generational the wealth. We need yeah, college we, we, funds. When we talked about Lumumba very briefly, Le, Patrice Lumumba before he becomes a revolutionary was trying to be part of this of all a class. And yeah. it ended up going bad for him because he gets caught for embezzling. Right. And right. he has to go to jail. But part of his thing was like, and if you if you study the Avale thing within the Belgium um, colonial system was, OK, these type of black people, these kind of Africans get to live in this neighborhood and white people actually come to inspect their homes and see if they're living properly. Now, that doesn't happen that nasty today, but it's a similar thing where the more you disassociate yourself from that group you're going to, you know, take on certain norms. That's just, the, that's what I mean, it's a material thing. It's not just, to your point, it's not just like, oh, so here's the bag. Now that does yeah. happen sometimes, but, but, but a lot of times <laughs> it's not, it's not it's, just It's that not simple. as explicit and you don't nah. realize, 
you don't realize you've crossed the line until you you look at your you, people are reflecting back to you where you are. You know what I'm saying? People that you whose opinions you you appreciate. I um, think that's part of why now there is a a commodification of the radical and the pro-black shit, because that also creates a certain cover for your class mm. if you're not openly disassociating yourself from the so-called real people. So now I'm going to be like, yeah, I'm black and I'm still black and I can go to target and still be black and I can work here and still like, it's become a way because like you were saying earlier, people got to a point where we, we were able to see through the person who openly disassociated and said, I wasn't, I'm not black. I'm, I'm the new black or like, we yeah. don't really black people overall, that doesn't work anymore. So you kind of have to assume a certain fake radicalism to stay marketable, you know, yeah, to stay profitable yeah. to the corporation. You can't really disassociate yourself in the way that maybe you did 10, 15 years ago because no one's going to really rock with you if you don't perform that. So that's on one side, that's a positive, but then the other side, that's a major negative because people are selling out stuff and in, totally in obscuring. Yeah. yeah. In, insert the image. I'll, I'll never forget this. The cost, the Black Panther cosplay at the marches in 2020 they went viral it was a sister beautiful sister yeah we put and that like, picture in the book yeah. did you i didn't i don't know yeah. if i saw it but and it was like at first i was like oh yeah they out there i'm like well, wait that's that don't quite look right and then you and see they, them were, literally they yeah. were literally actors yeah literally actors and I, I, who who hired them what was the, i don't I, that i don't know i remember i just know rasul who's over the pictures he put that in the book like he there's literally a picture of those people you're talking about that's why i think they're in the the chapter on Black Wall Street, actually, but yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, that was a <laughs> uh, that's a wild that the the sur the surreality like that right next to um, Nancy Pelosi and Kent they cloth kneeling um, at the cap, <laughs> but those are easy targets. But all right, so let, let's let's wrap it up. Um, so last couple of things you want to put out there specifically, like obviously where they can get the book, when they can get the book, um, and then also just uh you know, find closing messages and where to find mm. etc yeah so the i'll send the the link and all of that will be in this description for the book as well as the discount code i know some of these people are students so i'm i'm very um you know sympathetic because it's a higher price book than i would have liked um so the, you can find it on rutledge.com it's all it's available on rutledge.com but it's available on amazon and stuff too but you can get it cheaper at rutledge um you know free shipping etc um laundering black rage and then the i don't know if we ever said the subtitle but laundering black rage the um the washing of black death people property and profits mm -hmm. um and it's uh, about it's not too long of a book it's, it's very thorough but it's not too long of a book i don't know how fd feels about the length of no, it no no i mean it's it's, um, it's 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 so it's it's gonna it's a book that's it's more accessible than your typical academic you know uh chapter book that you have to read in a class. I see that where it's going to get get a lot of its life. Um, but uh, it's also really accessible. Like when I think about, um, you know, uh, like Elite Capture was like really short and other books that are similar where I, I, I think a lot of people can get through it in a week. You know what I'm saying? Without mm -hmm. having it be like feeling like they are studying. Um, I know I, I, I read it on and off, like, you know, on flight um before lunch you know before i had to pick up kids etc and i and i did it i one of the hardest parts of me was having to read it on one of these because i'm not that type of person i don't know how people can read off tablets i don't it does not work for that's, me it's funny that's all i read on i don't even i, I barely buy a physical book i cannot do it but maybe it's i don't know um but yeah it's it's not a it's not a this is something that anybody that wa is watching this could read without much struggle to like get through the ideas and decipher, you know, a bunch of academic jargon. Y'all break things down. Y'all introduce a lot of history, you know, that is, I don't want to say hidden, right? Like I don't want to, you know, play on that desire to find the hidden truth, mm -hmm. but there's right. a lot of value in representing um, and introducing ideas that are either watered down or missing from our p political discourse even from people who consider themselves woke. Like I definitely recommend this for people who think themselves um, aware and uh, engage with black political ideology and movement because it, it does a very good job of like kind of 
pulling, like sifting through dirt to pull out important stuff that's missing. You know, saying like, all right, look, you think your your nonprofit wave and your, you know, uh, you know, your whatever it was like the radical movement, it kind of wasn't. And it doesn't force you to feel bad because you haven't read George Jackson yet. You know what I'm saying? So like mm -hmm. good stuff. I, I really recommend it. And no, I'll do that you. like. No, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think it's we try to wrestle with 2020, but like you said, we also are more so interested in like the history of it because it's important to know that the some of the things I think we've all seen in 2020 and and so and and afterwards, um, there's a longer history of that, you know, and that our rage is easily commodified, you right. know, black rage and other rages for that matter, because I we know black rage inspires a lot of other people's rage, like mm -hmm. we talk about kids that go to the, the 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 Wendy's to watch it burn down or whatever some of that is obviously you know um adventurism and stuff but right. some people really are genuinely invested in that stuff right so I think anybody can read it and learn um you know just what you're really up against which is all I think as a scholar your job is to try to help people understand what they're up against so they can act like yeah. we can't make you do anything but we can at least clarify what you're up against right. and give you some some better bound and, and, and also yeah. what strategies the the unintended consequences of certain strategies mm -hmm. and and how to predict the next move after a strategy has been implemented so you know your organization decided okay we're going to take this grant you got to keep the doors open keep people's paychecks from coming i i get it what do you do with that how do you how do you re like you say relaunch that you know, stuff yeah. like that. Um, I got to get up out of here. I got to remake the thumbnail because this video is, uh, this shit is bombing. And <laughs> so oh, we got to figure out what to do here. Uh, so yeah, it, it's like that sometimes. Figure it out, yeah. But yeah, so. Does it need a new title or does it, it need a in the, it, I, I got to, you know, I feel like at the beginning with videos, I got to put my face in the thumbnail to, to make sure all my people know it's me. I mm -hmm. think they're used to that. Versus if I come up with a really cool thumbnail for other people. The like, the one when I was in, you I don't know if you were ever in that thumbnail. Were see, you? that one, I, I already knew that one. Like, mm. you, it, it was called Fuck the Police. It actually sent right. me into like a little bit of a, of a depression because it was so successful. And I had, like, I had, that's why I said when I said this book kind of put me in my place. Like, I went, I, I called up Dr. Ball near Tyriot after that video kind of like really started to do numbers. Because I was like, yo, what did I really do here? Like, what did I really do in the grand scheme of things by putting this on YouTube and, and making a, a commodity out of it? Like, I had this real, like, hard conversation about, like, like, and you see, since that video, I've done very little political content. I, I've been like, you know what? I don't know if I'm comfortable with, like, really intense political conversations as a YouTuber influencer guy. It just didn't feel right to me. Um, I'll probably return eventually, but I needed a break. Um, but yeah, same situation, but, um, thank you so much, man, for coming through. Um, uh, uh, please people, uh, in the description of the video will be, uh, you said 20, 20% discount from Rutledge. Yeah. Or the if book, not, if, I might, if I can, a minimum. If, yeah, 20% discount, you can go pre-order it now. It will come out. I don't know if I ever said this. It will be out April 11th. Okay. So it will be mailed out by April 11th. Uh, and that's when the book will be like live but you can pre-order it now on rutledge.com or it really anywhere but you can get it cheaper on rutledge.com and since the book is a little pricier i would suggest using the 20 percent discount no, uh, no. if you book if you can't afford it I'll, uh, the essays that preceded the book will also be in the in in the description which are pretty much chapters one and two effectively other than a few missing you know a few like thousand words or so Right. So, you know, if you just, if you all you can do is read those, that's, that's a good start. Right. So. If you can support, please support. Yeah. If you just want the the ideas, we'll have access for that too. Makes sense. Um, appreciate you so much too, Black. Uh, I'm going to say peace out to everybody. And I'm going to record button.